All right, so we left off talking about contemporary whitehead scholarship, uh, specifically Latour and Stengers, um, and their relevance for critiquing a type of one-dimensional scientific worldview that is so prevalent and in many ways so damaging uh, today. So I want to continue this train of thought and discuss... Um, the complexity hidden behind what we call a, a sort of neat and tidy scientific fact or a scientific object, um, something like a microbe or a virus, right, as we said before. Um, and what, what are the problems inherent in such a one-dimensional uh, metaphysics or ep epistemic view of the world? Yeah, like... Uh... For example, the, the reason I mentioned the COVID situation so much is I think it's uh, very much exemplary of this, uh, uh, what uh, some scholars call techno-solutionism. So the idea that uh, technology can solve our issues, we just have to listen to the science. Like uh, every time uh, politicians uh, uh, use these kinds of slogans that, oh, we just have to listen to what the data is telling us, what the science, follow the science. Like this is a very, very common, common expression for this kind of technocratic uh, idea. And I think those scholars are very much, and researchers are correct, who emphasize that uh, this is, things aren't so simple. Like, uh, sure, the, the vaccines solved this, this particular instance, like the, the infection rates went down around the world and then the pandemic was solved. But these are sort of uh, this mentality of quick fixes, so like for the climate as well, like you have uh, read some researchers working on geoengineering. Like, oh, we can just uh, manipulate the climate, we can put like uh, maybe molecules of gases in the air, in the atmosphere, we can like bring down the temperature, or at least slow it down a little bit. So these, uh, these sort of band-aid solutions uh, don't really address the underlying ecological problems which are driving like the, the increase in zoonotic, uh, you know, like bird flu and uh, coronavirus, like this increase in interspecies viruses, for example. Like the underlying driver is climate change. And this, this science, scientism would, would just say, oh, well, technology did create these issues, but technology, more technology can solve these issues like without addressing the, the fundamental social problems which are driving all of these things because that will be like the real solution but uh, no, very few people will want to talk about these things which are driving all of these phenomena these, these hybrid phenomena which a lot of people would say that modernity is sort of generating more and more hybrid entities more and more uh, unintended consequences and uh, uh, which we can't always solve with simple band-aid solutions. So I take techno, that's the problem with techno solutionism and, and scientism is that uh, reality is way more complex than just, oh, well, there's a problem, we just put like a quick solution and that, then we can forget about everything. Like that, that's, uh, I think, the most important insight from thinkers like Latour, Stengers and, and Whitehead is that uh, reality doesn't doesn't work that way we can't say that uh, oh well here's the problem the like this would be the same as saying that the climate crisis is just about the concentration of uh, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere okay just come up with a technological solution reduce the concentration of greenhouse gas problem solved that would be like a scientific idea, but but the fundamental social drivers of this issue remain unaddressed for such a position. So this is why we have to be very uh, skeptical of these kinds of, uh, or, or like the data, like the, the the data will reveal the truth. Like this is a very common common everyday. Uh, we we can find articles or where they found data about this and this, and the, this is the this and this is the policy recommendation from this data. This is very common um, for every issue. So I think uh, this helps us be a little bit more skeptical and think more holistically about uh, about these, these issues. Like uh, we can't say that one episteme, episteme to, to uh, quote Foucault's expression, that one episteme is relevant and exclusively relevant to everything else, especially not retroactively. Like, uh, F Foucault wasn't, I think, a relativist. 
McKnight or Winslow to us. So they aren't saying that, for example, in the example of mental illness, Foucault doesn't say that in the medieval times or before that there weren't mentally unstable people, that there's real stuff going on. Like, uh, we can't say that people don't get ill. The problem is that if we uh, apply one episteme to, like, in an absolute sense, without thinking about the history behind it, so, like, uh, it is just reminded me of William James's uh, idea of religious experience, um, the, the varieties of religious experience. It's a very similar insight that uh, William James says, like, every every founder of a religion or every mystic they would be like uh, they're diagnostically crazy like those kinds of people are like they're, they're suffering from like serious mental illness like uh someone who hears like a burning bush talking to them like <laughs> today we would say that's a paranoid schizophrenic yeah. Yeah. but uh there's some uh, we feel that this is not entirely correct to describe someone in that way or like the and it's not just for past examples, uh, like there was the sci-fi writer, Philip K. Dick, huge, huge, huge writer. And uh, he, he had like voices speaking to him and like uh, spiritual experiences. And from, from a psychological episteme, he was, uh, he, he was a sufferer of mental illness. But uh, so, uh, we, we feel that there is, at least my view is that things are more complicated than that, mm -hmm. even in, in this regard. So we can't just shoot on someone and just categorize them as mentally ill, for example. Absolutely. It's, it's, uh, it's if, uh, before we move on, I, I, wanna, I want to say something uh, about uh, some of the really, really good things, really good points you made before. So, um, First of all, the, the, the problem with um, technocratic solutions and the scientific, what we should call, I think, faith in scientific solutions, it really comes down to blind faith in many ways. Um, sort of cookie cutter solutions, as they like to say. Um, there is, uh, and you, before you mentioned that another problem with scientism or part of the problem with scientism is that there's an epistemic monopoly. Right, there's an epistemic monopoly which says this is the only correct way to look at things, right? This ties back to Foucault and Thomas Kuhn as well, right? Because if we keep looking at our age as the culmination, right? Maybe there's a Hegelian bias here, right? If we look at it as a culmination of all the epistemic formations that led to this point, right? This is terrible hubris, right? This is very arrogant. And this is a type of anthropocentrism, right? Because we're saying today's age is the one that has everything right, right? Or most things right. And so there's an annexation, there's an annexation, there's a there's a, a stealing away, not only of, of, of what can be said meaningfully, right? To say in, in Foucault's way, um, but there's, there's an annexation of ethics, right? We're saying ethics has become a technical problem now. We can just calculate our way through ethical problems. And this creates, not only is that incorrect, but this creates a specific political problem, which is that non-specialists are excluded from public discourse, which has direct effect on their lives, right? So I, I wanted to mention that because that's very important. And going back to the epistemic view, um, this is what Thomas Nagel called the, few, the view from nowhere, right? This is the problem because we think we have a view from nowhere. We have an objective view of the problem which goes back to the anthropocentrism and the, and, and the hubris of saying that today we've, we've figured all, all of this out. Um, and, and again, this ties back as well with, with reductionism and saying that we can just break reality apart into the smallest atoms and then we'll just, we're just going to find a limit, right? And modern developments with quantum mechanics has shown that, well, so far we haven't found the limit, the point at which... Uh, we can find out the smallest objects in the universe. So we are confronted in a way, in a way, so to make, to finally make the Wittgensteinian co connection, uh, though there have been several already, um, we are bumping against the limits of our own language, right? But in this case, the language is the scientific method that we have taken for granted as the best solution. Um, there's other Wittgenstein connections as well, like the fact value distinction is very important for Wittgenstein. Um, that's the point of his his idea of language games, uh, but in the in the early Wittgenstein as well, the Wittgenstein of the Tractatus, uh, he 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 does something very sinister. I think if you are a sort of very sort of rational minded person, 
the type who is held captive by the scientific picture, um, what he does with the Tractatus is that he paints a picture where you think you have that neat and tidy reality made up of objects and facts, but then at the end he reclaims his own work completely and he says this is a work of nonsense, right? And so what you wanted, what you wanted, you, you, you're not getting, not only are you not getting, but it's almost like he's helping you out of an addiction. It's almost like an addictive view of reality that you want it compartmentalized into these neat boxes, neat objects and facts and states of affairs. So, I mean, that's my overall point. Not only does it not, only does it not work at the scientific level, at the epistemic level, but it creates serious ecological and, and political problems. It, it creates barriers to human freedom and self-expression. I think uh, this this connects very uh, very well. I just wrote wrote up some some uh, points which which you mentioned that um, I think the, the the basic issue with the society today and this is very much present in Whitehead's uh, social critique in in uh, science and the modern world is that society has become like functionally separated. Like you have not just scientific specialization, but the, the areas of society itself has become as a whole very complex, very complicated. And there's there's no uh, view from nowhere, as you mentioned at the top of this, which can like in, in the panopticon, it can like exactly. uh, see everything and like observe that, that they would very much like leaders would very much like to have this position, this all encompassing, you know, they join all of the data together and then seeing everything as it happens in real time that's like a dream of like silicon valley technocrats that oh we can just can get every big data together and we can we can create this view from nowhere maybe like in a, in a, a artificial intelligence uh, god or something or if, if not we ourselves then something we can create something which has this view and which can observe human society as a whole, and then we can construct it the way we want to. So this 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 entire idea that science has the key to social processes, science can say what politics should do, what economics should do. Um, this is completely uh, completely false. I think this idea that science is the system of society which can tell everything else what to do, as if society were just like a big machine as inputs, outputs, so we could just uh, figure out what to put in, what to put, get out. So this is like Lego, Lego-like view of reality, just like pieces, we can take it out, put it back in. And that's like completely not how an organism works. Like you can't, uh, well, you can like uh, take out like transplants, for example, like take out the heart and put it back in. But it can't like stop completely. Like you can't shut down an organism and then start it again. It's very hard to do that. Like you can have a transplant, but uh, like uh, uh, Whitehead's point when talking about uh, actual occasions as organisms, he says that society is an organism. You, you can't just shut it down and restart it again. Like that, you know, you had the lockdowns in, in, in COVID and this, this idea we can just put push a button and close it down and then open it back up again. Well, uh, as we can see, the, the unintended consequences of this uh, pressing the button and shutting it down, uh, we've had enormously bad consequences from this, like economic stuff, huge inflation, you know, around the world. That That's an excellent economics example of, of this uh, of the reason that why society is an organism which you can't just remote control. And and that, that that's something which isn't emphasized, I think, enough uh, today. I think this is something which is sort of uh, even even uh, by uh, like radical thinkers, they don't uh, emphasize this. I think enough that that society isn't something that humans can control, especially not from like a centralized uh, form. So I think that this is a very important insight for, from Whitehead, um, which is a huge political ramifications. And uh, as you mentioned, the the example of uh, of uh, like of uh, of, yeah, of like uh, the, the nonsense which mm -hmm. which this leads to. I think uh, uh, my impression of Wittgenstein's uh, uh, introduction of this, uh, like at the end of Tractatus, the nonsense. Like this is like a, he's trying to like enlighten the reader. Almost. 
almost like a sudden enlightenment, or something like shocking the reader that, oh, well, this is nonsense what I've just been reading. So I have this sense of like trying to uh, awaken and shock the reader out of their uh, complacency. Absolutely, and, uh, absolutely. I, I, especially yeah, when you, especially considering how much effort it takes to get through the book, you know? <laughs> Yeah, it's very systematic, very analytical, and, uh, and and in Whitehead also you have often these shocking sentences or these radical uh, um, declarations, which which I think have a similar function to shock us out of our complacent, uh, everyday, conventional, uh, common sense uh, uh, views. Yeah, Whitehead does say, uh, I think, I think it was in the science and uh, science in the modern world. He says. An interesting proposition uh, is more important, more valuable than a true one, right? And somewhere along those lines, he also says that propositions don't reflect reality. Uh, they lure the listener into, right? So propositions, they sort of uh, seduce us into believing them. So there's always an element of rhetoric in every proposition, even logical and mathematical ones. Absolutely. Um, like uh, in science also, like science is full of rhetoric. Like this is something which Latour also talks uh, a lot about, that there's not a, science doesn't work that way. It's just objective statements of fact. Like scientists have to sell their, their ideas and, and they, they often work with like rhetorical devices. Like a, a scientist, uh, at least the, the famous scientists, they have to uh, sell their ideas to a wide audience and they have to say, oh, why is this important? Why is this relevant? So and it's full of, uh, we could cite many examples of, of rhetoric in science. Like, uh, for example, like when uh, scientists who are studying the consciousness, they make a discovery and then we can say, oh, like we have discovered that the basis of emotions, for okay. example, as, as if uh, emotions are like in the brain and we have found the basis for I do we have like these headlines every day, like the basis for aggression or the mm -hmm. genetic, even the genetic basis of, of aggression, for example, like as if it's like something which can be reduced to genes. This is like one of the, the manias of uh, contemporary uh, like mind research. Yeah. So okay. it, it's, it's a lot of rhetoric in, in, in science. Okay, wonderful. Um, well, if you if you don't have anything to add, maybe we can uh, sum summarize and uh, conclude our our wonderful conversation. Yeah, yeah I'm uh, sure that's that's good, good 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 idea. I think, and uh, yeah, I'm very grateful that we could like talk about so much uh, stuff. Hopefully, it's not too uh, not not too. Uh, how should I put it? So, um, so I, th I think we, we covered lots lots of points, and uh, I thought hopefully it wasn't too technical. So, we would like uh, have like a, it, I hope it's accessible for, for everyone. right. I, I I think you made you did a really good job of making this accessible and, and down to earth. So, I'm hoping uh, that those viewers who are not uh, specialists, right, as we say. Because uh, we, because I mean, we like to say that we're not specialists either, right? That was the one of the main points um, of this conversation, right? We want to have a broad knowledge, and we want to communicate in ways that people can understand and relate to. Otherwise, what's the point? Okay, well, thank you again so much for uh, for agreeing to have this talk, and I'm looking forward to uh, our future conversations, uh, future discussions, and so forth. Thanks, and thank you very much. I'm very grateful, and uh, I'm also looking forward to future collaborations too. Thanks. Perfect.